Hi, and welcome to Rethink IT, a podcast about the best tech innovations and digital products developed in Moldova. I'm Daniela, the community manager at Moldova Innovation Technology Park and one of the podcast hosts. And I'm Dimitri, I'm a businessman and a marketing specialist. I'm glad to join Daniela in this podcast, Rethink IT, and dive into the stories of our guests and bring you the marketing perspective of each story. In every episode, we'll unveil a new hidden champion from the local tech ecosystem. We're planning to have refreshingly honest, open and fun conversations as we will unpack our guests' strategies, learn from their experiences and also find inspiration around innovative uses of technology. What exactly is no code? We're kind of challenging the, the way people are creating software. Number one in everything. We definitely believe this is the beginning. So how did you go global from Moldova? I got lucky, uh, I guess. Biggest challenges you've had on a personal level? I wake up, I, I meditate, I think about plan, plan a day. Hi, and welcome to Rethink IT, a podcast by Moldova Innovation Technology Park. In this episode, we have Vlad Larin, the co-founder of a suite of no-code products that enables entrepreneurs to build apps. The Among the early adopters of the no-code movement, they've also organized the biggest no-code conference last year, and all of this from Moldova. Vlad, welcome. Thank you. In our space where innovation happens. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming over. And... Uh, Tell us, no more code in a world where um, technology is in our booming, uh, where in a world where it feels like IT specialists are the most wanted human beings on earth. Right. <laughs> But uh, jokes aside, the idea of no code has really been picking up lately. Uh, what exactly is no code? If you can get a bit more, um, even technical if you want, because mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of listeners or watchers don't really understand fully what a no code is and maybe in here you can also introduce what zero code sure is. yeah well, well no code is very wide actually pretty much all the software that we are using you are using and everybody who's listening to this is using is no code we just kind of call it in a different name because what we mean when we're saying no code is the development tools that are used to create stuff like software applications workflows and, and everything but actually no code is more of an idea Uh, idea that um, is about making things simpler for people to use. Like if we compare, let's say, writing an uh, email campaign today and writing an email campaign 20 years ago, which is not that mm -hmm. long ago, actually, maybe even 15 years ago. Okay, maybe no, not 15, but 20. Uh, it would be a completely different task. So you would need a, a developer to do that. He would need to create a database with a list of people with their names and their email addresses. And there would, has to be a software that will create a SMTP connect that would basically establish a connection with the email server and then send all these one by one. So you can't ask your you know, secretary to do that because she won't know where to start. But today's click, 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 you're done. And there's like a multitude of tools. That's mm -hmm. no code because you don't need to code to do that. Mm -hmm. You actually have a software that makes it easy, that focuses that on just on the steps that are necessary to get it done. Same with the text processor. So Microsoft Word, what is that if that's not no code? Because previously you had to work in the command line interface where you have to learn and, and know the specific commands. Like uh, for people who are, into this, like VI is a nightmare. Basically, mm -hmm. you're creating a document and then, then you don't know how to stop and how to go back to the command line. And it's mm -hmm. like, a, you know, you press the wrong button and you're done, it's mm -hmm. lost. But it's still text processing, like in the end of the day. So people needed to type their text and send it, save it as a document. Today we have Microsoft Word, we have Notes, we have Notion, whatever, that's no code. So same applies to the programming and development. Basically, you don't necessarily have to write ones and zeros and stuff. Even the modern development languages are pretty much following that trend. So previously there was assembler, right? Ones and zeros, ones and zeros. That's actually what the computer understands. He doesn't understand uh, VAR, EI equals two less than when, I mean, this is all human language. So that was created to simplify the communication with the computer. So no code, what is called by no code development tools are pretty much the next generation of programming languages, if you will. So it's a visual, uh, now slowly segueing into what zero code does. Zero code pretty much promotes that approach and uh, explains that this is actually not something that you have to fear of. This is something that you are, you know, you need to chase basically to embrace it because that's what has been happening in the last 50 years, at least, if not more. So we are creating content, we're 
talking to people, we're going on conferences, we have the educational courses that would teach people how to do that. We are um, creating templates that can give people a jump start to kind of literally created in a matter of minutes, maybe an hour, something really complex, not just a landing page. or So that's uh, like WordPress for websites, but for more advanced tools. Exactly. Uh, custom yeah. made platforms. Exactly. Yeah. So WordPress was pretty much an inspiration because uh, the internet is running on WordPress pretty much. So I mean, that's like, I think around 50%, maybe 60, maybe 40, I don't remember. But around that number of old websites in the world are based on WordPress CMS. Mm -hmm. And yeah, most of them are simple enough, let's say so. We're not speaking about Airbnb or Facebook. And that niche is pretty much vacant. There's no tool, there hasn't been a tool up until now that would uh, allow people to create something like that on their mm -hmm. own, similar to what they did with WordPress templates. So um, how does this work with uh, WordPress? You pretty much think of a website, go to a template marketplace, you find something that looks like and feels like yep. close to what you had in mind for your idea. You pretty much go change the the text, the, the the colors, set it up a little bit, and if you go with a simple enough website, maybe even maybe not simple enough, but mm -hmm. basically something that was in the template. But if you need, let's say, an Uber for podcasting, or I don't know, a, a delivery application for Moldova, mm -hmm. you can't really uh, pick a, Word for, a WordPress template for that. But you can pick a no code template for that, or a zero code template for that. We have, by the way something that would be equally uh, great for both podcasting and delivery in Kishinev. Um And you start there and the approach is exactly the same. So you tweak stuff, you change it, you play around, but you can go so much deeper. You can actually play with the logic. You can change it. You can disable it, enable it, enhance it. This is kind of what no, no code is here to change, to give you more depth, to give you more opportunity and to take it to be able to take it to whatever you want it to to go. I heard you say once that everything is possible with zero code Pretty in much. an interview, I think. Yeah. But there should be some limitation to it. I mean, th there should be something that it's not possible. I don't, I don't know, maybe mm -hmm. a program uh, for Alexia or... Sure. Uh, yeah, you, uh, can. you can do that with zero... Uh, yeah, no? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I'm, I'm buying it. I believe it's the right moment now to <laughs> tell us what exactly you do. Yeah. And who are your customers and how and what are you doing for them and how you make their life more simple? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll try to answer both in one <laughs> shot. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things that you can do with zero code and, um, and with no code in general. Um, and uh, the, the, the boundaries are constantly expanding. So there are some things which are, let's say, better suited than the others uh, to be done with no code, obviously. There's no framework out there that is perfect for everything. It just doesn't exist. So different languages have their different specialities. Mm -hmm. So uh, you never know what um, you know. <laughs> some things are just better than the others for, for some stuff. Um, and what we do in Zero Code is we are uh, helping people to get to where they want faster, easier, on their own, and saving a lot of time and money on the way. So we have different customer segments that we're serving. Um, the first one that we started with uh, are pretty much small businesses and founders, people with ideas that uh, didn't necessarily have the amount of money or time that would be typically necessary to, to create, let's say, a startup. So let's say I have an idea uh, about uh, some sort of a killer application. So typically what would I need to do is I would either need to know how to code myself to kind of do it on my own. I would... Uh, the other option is to find a technical co-founder, which would pretty much do it for me uh, after I explain my idea. Or I would need to uh, find a team and uh, find some money, funding, I mean, whatever. Um, I don't know, get a bank loan. Uh, that, that would be like one of the few options available. So if you don't have a technical co-founder, if you don't know how to code yourself and you don't have a lot of money, you're pretty much out of luck. Uh, you, has been, you have been at least. Now it's different because you actually have a... Uh, the no code as a way to go because you can either do it yourself, learn it and tweak it, you know, and launch it and show it to people, demonstrate it to get, let's say, a funding because that's a lot of, uh, that's what a lot of people are coming to us for. They say, hey, we have this idea. We want to pitch it to the investors, but instead of showing them PowerPoint, we actually want to show them the working application. Maybe even this mm -hmm. has some revenue already. And uh, we were like, okay, great. And uh, what usually takes, let's say, the traditional developing agencies like months to develop, maybe even years tech to, to us, let's say a certain level for the version one or even the MVP, we do in weeks. That's the first type of customers that we're uh, serving. The second type of customers are people who'd like it to do them, themselves. Maybe basically, um, maybe they're, they're technical. 
maybe they're just super passionate or they don't have, let's say, a few thousand dollars to spend, uh, which is uh, applicable to a lot of people. Or maybe they're just not that sure in the idea so far. Um, they just want to play around, put it in front of people and validate their idea. Mm -hmm. So for those people, the templates work the best because they, they're finding a template. Let's say they want, the, as I said, Uber for, I don't know, wine. <laughs> no. um, and um, instead of buying a super expensive application or again getting a lot of people to do it for them basically there's something that's you know widely known uh, they can get a template for a few hundred dollars um, tweak the name tweak the logic add whatever they need to and remove whatever they don't need to uh, with the visual intuitive interface in their browser I mean you can literally do it on your tablet i'm doing that all the time uh, and um and that's it they have the the first version they have the prototype they can learn they can tweak they can play with people they can get feedback and uh if they would choose to at some point they can get investor money they can actually you know build their whole business around this tool so this is the second type of people that we're serving so with the with your tools can i design an application for my cats at home sure yeah Uh, How long is it going to take? Depending on what you want to do with your cats at home. But uh, probably for you, um, assuming that you have, let's say, some understanding about, let's say, how the development goes, probably it will take, I don't know, a day, maybe less than that. Oh. Depending on how complex it is. Because so I cats just are complex. go and buy a template for $200? and then I just enjoy so, the process. That's one way, yes. A template gives you a head start. Basically, if you're not sure of how to do this particular thing, what's the best way, a template can be a great reference for where you, to get started. Later on, maybe you can build a completely new module which was not included into the original template, but you know it serves your purpose. Or maybe you can reuse some of the stuff that is within the template to tweak it in a way that you would like to work at best. So And launching an online business, because it's a very common thing now, not only in Moldova, but worldwide. How long it's going to take me if uh, I want to open this wine shop, for instance? Yeah, I mean, probably we have a few templates for online shops. So just to, to literally launch it will take minutes. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you want to you know, go about and, and tweak and brush up the design, maybe, I don't know, add a few things here and there, upload products that will just be, uh, I don't know, if does it count as a development? That's basically a setup already because you don't really develop stuff. You kind of take it and, and go. Content failing. Yeah, more or less. From what I understood, you have like four solutions at Zero Code. You would have templates for website and applications. You mm -hmm. would have the Academy. Yes. Teaching me bubble. Mm -hmm. And then you would have your consultancy or implementation services. That's right. We also have a converter of uh, bubble applications to native applications, meaning something that you can upload to App Store and Google Store, mm -hmm. so which is a, a, an independent component on its own, because it, by default, uh, the bubble application is a web app, meaning a website that works equally well on your tablet, desktop, laptop, or a phone. But if you want to upload it to App Store and add some native stuff to it, like, I don't know, fingerprint recognition, whatever, you would need a native application mm -hmm. uh, for that, and we, we offer that too. And what's booming now? I mean, from what you see on your sales, I mean, what people are working on? Well, there's a lot of things because um, we're working from people all over the world and it depends on the region. Let's pick Ooh. our region. Or our region, really I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> What's the region you work with? Then? Uh, mostly it's the, the United States uh, and Western Europe and a few other countries such as Canada, Australia. Okay, so what about America then? Because things are happening way ahead of us, so, yeah. <laughs> so we can anticipate. A lot of people are excited about blockchain. They don't really know what to do with it yet. They're like, okay, blockchain, we want to do blockchain something. And uh, But I, I almost want to discard it at the moment because people don't really get why. I mean, they kind of get why, but it's not real stuff. A lot of delivery applications, a lot of telemedicine, a lot of uh, marketplaces where in some specific niches where people are selling, let's say, art uh, or, um, well, or some other stuff that is specific, again, to their particular marketplace. So people are niching down and um, expanding, let's say, horizontally instead of uh, vertically. And you mentioned that you're always looking to, you know, create something that it's not yet there. Yeah. And how do you go for this ideation or innovation process in mm -hmm. your team? 
uh, when building your products, you know, the ones you create as templates and sell. And uh, what are what is one of the most exciting product that you've built? Well, there has been a few examples. Uh, well, first of all, for, for our templates, uh, we, we would love to do something extraordinary that wouldn't exist, but that would be actually uh, something that people would be difficult to to comprehend for people because if you say that the templates are kind of created for for the match with the existing ideas like this is a template that is like Facebook or like Tinder or like solving Uber. a pain that already yeah, exists on the market yeah, mm-hmm. exactly so uh, the, the templates by definition can't be revolutionary mm-hmm. almost I mean it would be like counterproductive because if okay. it would be something like I don't know blockchain for for cats and like okay nobody has ideas okay. for blockchain for cats so what do I do with the templates and nobody buys it so uh, for, for templates we're kind of going for something that is well known well understood validated and to act as a as a fun, like a baseline for for people to then do something extraordinary with it like based on their ideas and their experiences so um, although we have a lot of wonderful templates that are basically you know uh, one of the, uh, the the last ones, which is kind of interesting, actually, was a template for mindfulness and meditation applications. Uh, we just launched it, I think, this month, uh, which is not that common of an idea, actually, now that we think of it. But uh, I think it's pretty cool. It looks great. And uh, it's really resonating with what we kind of practice and preach within our teams. So uh, it's an application to, to which you can upload content. It has some timings, schedulings, like... Um, kind of keep people on track of whatever they're trying to be mindful about. And, uh, well, there's a lot of uses for it, but uh, it's it's kind of specific. And how much does, does does it cost and how many uh, sales or downloads? I don't know if it's download, downloads probably of templates. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think it costs up to I mean, a couple hundred dollars. I'm not, I'm not sure what was the latest price. We had a lot of um, discounts. So it's within hundreds? Yeah, yeah, like maybe... No more than three hundred dollars, mm-hmm. um, and it took about a month to develop because mostly we were just very picky with the design. Uh, otherwise, the functionality itself would be uh, much much simpler than that. Uh, and um, yeah, the downloads. It just we just started the sale the sales. I mean, it's like dozens. Uh, no millions yet. Or just, no, no, no. It's we, just, it's we just launched it, yeah. So we're do you hoping. Have, do you have uh, pl- um, templates that have been downloaded by millions? Uh, millions? No, not yet. Like, uh, what, what's the what's the biggest download? Uh, you've had? Thousands, like thousands. a few thousands. Uh, yeah, for a template. Um, but it's also, um, I think it's the the overall no code coming back to the the origins of the discussion. It, it, although it's booming, is it's getting mm-hmm. some traction. It's just scratching the surface because most of the people have no idea what that is about. They may have heard something, they have their own idea, which is usually mm-hmm. an incorrect one. And um, people are rarely, uh, let's say, trying out new stuff. So for no code, we're very early in the stage of mm-hmm. getting that adopted to the market. So most of the people are just sitting in and they're not sure what they can do with it. They're not sure how exactly this can benefit them. So uh, there's a lot of growth um, and millions of downloads uh, in the future, but not yet. <laughs> For research, you've mentioned, and I've noted that you are taking some feedbacks from customers. Yeah. Do you have a special process where you would talk to your consumers and uh, make some research? Well, both yes and no. Um, we have two different kind of direct contact. I mean, even three, four. Uh, different kinds of contacts with our customers. Uh, first one is we're talking to them directly. So, the, but they are specific kind of customers that are coming to us with ideas, and they say, "Okay, we have this. Let's say we have ten thousand dollars, and we want uh, a telemedicine application." So we're talking to them. Obviously, if if we see that there are like five people a month uh, asking about telemedicine, then it's it's probably a thing, uh, or um, you know something like that, but that's like one specific type of customer. Then there are the other type of customers which are pretty much hitting our support channels. We have a few. Mm -hmm. We have our online chat, we have our forums, and we have the Bubble Forum, which is a large community of no-coders where we also hang out and answer to people's questions. So this is where also we see that what are the trends, what are people asking, what are they happy or unhappy about? Both can be equally great sources of um, inspiration and ideas for for the stuff to be built. We're talking to our customers in chats mostly, and um, they're coming to us with ideas. They're coming to us with questions, with bugs that they find sometimes, uh, and uh, and this is kind of what we're using um, in in our own roadmap very much. But uh, also, anything can be a source of inspiration. Maybe we saw a podcast like like the one we're doing now, uh, or or something else uh, that happened in the industry that is basically you know making a lot of sense for us personally. So we just try it out. 
And that's one of the great things uh, with no code. You don't always have to think all that much. Um, if you like something, if you're passionate about it, you just go and do it. From what I've noticed, yeah, uh, you sort of build a community around this whole, well, no code movement and zero code, especially. You've also organized the biggest uh, no code conference or one of the biggest no, confer- the no big- code uh, conference. Well, yeah. Was it the biggest? It was the but- biggest online conference at the moment when it was organized. This year, basically two weeks ago, there was another big one. But yeah, up until a few weeks ago, it was the biggest one. <laughs> but the idea of the of the community, I guess, that's that's where you're gathering most of the feedback yes. and ideas and insights and exchanges of. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're kind of piggybacking here on the community of Bubble, which is a, a platform that we're building on uh, because they have done an amazing job to create a community of people who are really passionate about what they uh, what they do. It was a small one, but it was very engaged. I had never actually seen a, a community like that before, uh, ever, anywhere, for pretty much any other product. It's more like, okay, if you have a problem, you come to the forum, and you know, if you don't have a problem, you don't even know what where, if there, there is a forum. But uh, with Bubble, it's different. People are coming and exchanging ideas, sharing their experiences, helping each other out for free, uh, and uh, and you know, kind of asking to support each other out. So we were pretty much doing the same. We have been a uh, big... A supporter and the user of that community as well, because there's a lot of wisdom, there's a lot of learning uh, in, in that kind of a resource. And we're trying to kind of help the, the same community build um, a direct channel of communication with people around what we do and to get a feedback from them as well. If we're going in the wrong direction, they, you know, they will tell us. They usually do. And what about competitors? Uh, because obviously it's it's still scratching you know, the market, but it's, it's been growing yeah. uh, rapidly. And the competitors have also been uh, appearing from all over the <laughs> sure. place. Yeah, yeah. What are your competitors, first of all? And how do you, you know, keep on top of them? Right. <laughs> keep on innovating. That's a great question. Um, well, there are two levels of competitors, I would say. Um, say first level competitors is pretty much um, the whole world, meaning that, uh, that we're kind of challenging the, the way people are creating software. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking about WordPress, WordPress is our direct competitor in a lot of ways. I mean, they don't know about that yet, but they will. Now, the second level is um, is mostly the, the people that are working within the bubble ecosystem. Um, back in the day, there were just a few literally a few people that were just working uh, within, the, within that community. Because when we started, I think Bubble was... When was that? 2015? Uh, 2015, yes. Bubble was just a couple of hundred thousand um, users in total, which is not a lot. I mean, that's mm-hmm. actually <laughs> very little mm-hmm. if you compare that to, let's say, the overall amount of people who are using uh, anything like JavaScript or, or Python or, uh, or any other template builder or no code solution but uh, today bubble is um, I think almost million and a half uh, it's a different different thing they're growing I mean progressively so um, back then it was literally just a few people who were working kind of in a similar way that, that we did there was like a few agencies also who started back in uh, around that time maybe even a little earlier than we did but we were one of the I think first big three agencies globally there were a couple of uh, in, in Canada, in San Francisco, and in Kishinev, Moldova. Uh, that was the third one. And I think we're the biggest one still. Uh, we're the biggest agencies in terms of the, the, the amount of in-house people. Definitely number one in the amount of templates, number one in the amount of plugins. And uh, I think we're pretty much number one in the amount of completed products overall. Okay, tell me about number one in everything. Tell me, <laughs> please, the turnover, number of employees. Yes, and that's all. <laughs> Right, For so <laughs> <laughs> we're um, almost sixty people today. I think oh. we're fifty-eight, uh, which which is almost sixty, uh, and uh, most of them are here in Moldova. Uh, I think we have around twenty people who are remote uh, in Russia, Ukraine, and a few other countries. My co-founder is actually living in Bali, Indonesia, <laughs> most of the time, so he counts as a remote employee, I guess. Um, yeah, that's that's about the the the, the size of the team. In terms of the turnovers, I think we're, we're currently north of a million dollars per year, uh, which is, again, something that we're very proud of, but we definitely believe this is the beginning. Nice. What would you have done differently? Hmm. <laughs> That's a great question. Not much, actually, because I believe that uh, our, our growth curve is... Um, is very much tied to the growth of bubble. It's almost that we are helping them to grow and they're helping us to grow because uh, in the early days, I mean, now it's a little different. They have 
um, recently closed a, a funding round of $100 million, I think. So uh, right now they're, they have enough money to do their own marketing. But previously, we have been doing a lot of marketing for mm-hmm. Bubble. We've been literally telling about stuff, even, even today, a lot of things which I'm, I'm explaining and telling is pretty much the, the merit of So you were marketing Bubble. your products on Bubble? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. and there was no other way around it. So we couldn't explain where zero code template is unless we explain how Bubble works. Mm-hmm. And we've been speaking on conferences and, and stuff. So, um, and, and again, promoting, paying for, for, for advertisement and you know doing this no more code things that would uh, trigger people. Um, that they were promoting, we were promoting us, but alongside we were promoting yep. Bubble as well. So we were growing together. So now that Bubble is growing, even faster than they ever did before. We are growing faster than we ever did before. Mm-hmm. So um, the, now it's no, paying off. Yeah, <laughs> there, hopefully. Now so. you're having the return on investment. But there were no no shortcuts. We couldn't just pay more for advertising back in the day, and Bubble would suddenly grow like two x, three x, and there was no really way to. Do that. What does it work for advertising for you? And what are you trying? And what are you using? And what what is the best from your perspective mm. for you? Per- yeah, uh, content is. Is probably the, the the most convenient thing these days, meaning that uh, everyone does Google Ads, everyone does Facebook Ads, and it sometimes works, but it doesn't necessarily work for us specifically. We we are we're a bit specific. Maybe for some industries, uh, Google and Facebook is all it takes as long as you have enough budget. But for us, people um, actually want to know more. They have questions, same as the ones uh, you had today. What is this? How does it work? How does this can benefit me? Because this is not a, a ten dollar purchase usually. So people are kind of Thinking a little bit more, this is not a, not a, you know, a sudden rush for people to buy a template, even if it's a couple of hundred dollars. You usually think a little before you buy something like that, and even more so with with a custom development project, which is a few thousand dollars, mm-hmm. right? So you would kind of want to talk to someone. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's a lot of um, there's no quick ways for us to get to our customers. So we are trying to make ourselves pronounced as much as possible, meaning that we are. Um, Going on podcasts, so speaking mm-hmm. with people, creating products, putting it out there, and you know, kind of showing um, what we've done, telling us stories, and this is pretty much something—the only thing that has been working for us, really, because people are coming to us saying, "Hey, you know, we saw your product on Product Hunt, and it was it was pretty good. Can you do something like that for me?" We're like, "Yeah, sure." Or, "Whoa, we saw your interview, and uh, you know, somewhere, and uh, you said some cool th- cool things, and." Um, I thought that resonated with me really. And, uh, you know, they're coming to us eventually. It's not a quick one and it's kind of difficult to measure. Assuming your development path, let's say like that, uh, what's most important for you now? Is it uh, investments, mm-hmm. uh, talents, uh, ideas? What would you need now? Talents are always a priority because um, everything that's going on right now is because we have been lucky to to have a wonderful team that... Um, has grown together with us, um, has developed themselves and developed us to where we are right now. And we're, we're in this together and everyone is important. So starting from simple validation and testing of the stuff that we do over to people who are dealing with the support requests, which are not nice sometimes. I mean, they're very nice sometimes, but sometimes they're not. Uh, over to the developers, designers, project managers, marketing managers, HR managers. So it's so important. I mean... We couldn't have done that without a lot of people who are part of our team. So this is the number one priority uh, probably forever from day one. And uh, it will always be. Uh, the team is king. In terms of the next thing that we need is we need uh, more publicity and, and more success, I would say, from the people that we're helping. So I'm guessing that the, ne- the, the, the best thing that can happen in no-code space to promote the no-code space more is more successful people in no code space. So if there would be more companies saying, "Hey, you know, we we use no code and uh, you know we're killing it," uh, that would be the best promotion because people are, are inspired by that. Just say, if this dude could do that with no code, I can do that too. So and they would kind of go and try it out, and th- that would be the best validation. So instead of you know marketing and copy and you know telling how great it is, I mean everyone says that their stuff is great. But when people are coming and saying, hey, I did that and here's my company and we're earning like this much money or I did it myself uh, like on the weekend in the few you know, months or something, that would be a great a reference and inspiration. So we're, we're actively working on making more people successful in this niche and in this environment because this would be the best thing uh, long-term for both ourselves and the whole environment, maybe the whole world too, but... Yeah. 
And also, going, going back to talents, uh, it brings me to the question, what, you know, how do you retain your talent and how do you motivate them? Because you said you, you were lucky, but I guess that was engineered luck, actually. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, we're, we're both, both lucky and uh, working hard on that because... Um, there's no single culture that fit, fit, fits, let's say, everyone. Um, but mm -hmm. we believe that we created a unique one in our team. We're, we're very transparent. We're very honest and open with the team about what's going on. We have a, recently, I mean, last year since the pandemic hit, uh, we had a, a in-person meeting like every other month. And then kind of everyone we got together and talk about stuff that's going on pretty much like a presentation. But uh, since, um, since the pandemics, we are actually recording a monthly Uh, zero code series, zero code radio, we call it. Uh, where me and my founder just talk about stuff about what's going on and you know what's good, what's what's bad, and you know who came, who left, uh, what are the news, what has changed, what has improved. Da, 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 da. Uh, we're maintaining a lot of uh, direct feedback channels with the team, so we have the bots that we're using for for kind of getting the people's moods. Uh, we mm. we have a few mm -hmm. things which is called. Uh, a retrospective report. I believe once a quarter, people are getting a bot with a few yeah. questions. I mean, what's going on? How are you feeling? Uh, yes. Rate your experience from one to five. And, uh, you know, what are the good things that happened recently? What are the bad things that happened recently? So, and kind of like a lot of people are sharing brilliant ideas. I mean, and a lot of our uh, lucky hits were actually not ours. They were coming from a team. They were saying, hey, let's do, I don't know, movie Friday sometimes. And they're like, oh, that's a good idea. Why don't we do that? And we're having one this Friday, by the way. Uh, and uh, why don't we... You know, do this and do that. Why don't we, you know, meditate together? Oh, great. So why not? And uh, this is why I'm saying this is a team effort because it's not us like sitting and coming up with great ideas all the time. It's mostly at the opposite. We're just <laughs> getting all these great ideas from people and we're saying, yeah, that's actually a very good one. Let's try it out. Make them feel part of, part of it. They are. Yeah. They are a part of it. So um, it's... I'm sorry, was that just an, uh, uh, an invitation to the Friday night <laughs> <laughs> Friday so. movie? I so. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to. We have pizza as well. So. <laughs> okay, we're in. <laughs> <laughs> What's next for you? Oh, we're, um, we're doing a bit of, um, let's say, it, it's a long-term thing, but we're um, trying to equalize or balance out the, the services and the products part of our business, meaning that mm. um, if you like... Put it globally, there are two. What's the breakdown right now? Around um, 60 to 40, 70 to 30, uh, I would say. Around those numbers, depends on the month. 60 service and 40 product. Yeah, yeah. 60% of uh, revenues and uh, are coming from the services and around 40 to 30 are coming from the product. So we want to expand this ratio, like uh, speaking from a pure numbers perspective, to be uh, the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe even like maybe 80 to 20. Because services are great and they will definitely need to remain and grow and because they're a great source of inspiration and great sort of practice. I mean, we have learned everything that we know because we were working on services, working with people and we're keeping our, our, our hand on a the pulse there. But products are more scalable. And we believe that products can actually help more people. And because the services are, are although they're pretty cheap if we compare it to the traditional development costs, they're still not accessible for everyone. But the products are accessible for almost everyone. I would say everyone, if to put it like, uh, to say it honestly. And uh, we can help a lot more people to do a lot more stuff with products. And uh, this is, you know, again, I can scale the business, the company, the team a lot faster and a lot more. So we don't need to hire like a uh, hundred more people to grow a hundred fold. Um, if we like find new markets, uh, reach out to more people that will just buy more of our stuff. Everything so far sounds um, beautiful. Perfect, I <laughs> Perfect. Would say. But uh, there probably should have been some, you know, hard times. And I want to, to you to tell, to tell us more of um, human uh, side, biggest challenges you've had on a personal level in this mm -hmm. whole entrepreneurship journey. because it's not always, Rainbows. <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, well. And how did you deal with them? Right. Uh, definitely there are always challenges, even right now. Um, personally, because you're right, in retrospective, this all looks very, very good. Uh, but um, this not has it's not been a, a short journey. So we've been through um, a few curves and, you know, turns down the road. Um, I'm guessing that, yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, the human factor is... is Yeah, I guess important and something that is always unpredictable. And because uh, however hard you try, um, however diligent is your recruiting process, you're still going to make some mistakes. 
in, in terms of hiring people. And not because they're they're bad people. I mean, there there's no bad people in terms of you know, not at least in our team. There there has been no bad people, but some people just are not a good fit. And it's um it's kind of it's kind of hard to acknowledge that uh, you're um, well. You didn't make a very good choice, mm-hmm. and and um, it's also very hard to it's like accepting that you failed. In yeah, a way. yeah, yeah, yeah. You did, and it's, it's never never easy. And uh, also, the person you know is trying really hard, but that's just not his thing, her mm-hmm. thing. And uh, she or he would be much better off in a different place. And it's basically they have to acknowledge their failure too. And that's even more difficult. So uh, I guess that one of the most difficult parts has been um, saying goodbye to people. Um, that's, that's one thing. Um, and um, I'm, I can't say that it's, it's great now, but um, it, it's always difficult, but you kind of learn along the way that it's, it's better to acknowledge that somebody's not a good fit earlier rather than trying to kind of squeeze it out and... Uh, fix some stuff uh, and then that would never work out at the end of the day. So um, that has been one thing. Second uh, is trying to uh, find uh, the market fit because we're still kind of in process. I mean, we're, we're doing uh, pretty good in, in a lot of uh, dimensions, but we, there's still lots of, so, more, so much more potential. It's almost like we're, we're probably like less than 10% in to which we think we can to where we think we can be. So there's still a lot of discovery because this is a new world, if you will. And uh, we have to educate people all the time, ourselves included, about what it is and how it works. So um, I believe that um, there's a lot more guesswork that we have to do. There's a lot more risks and that we will have to take. And um, just just being uh, in that is, is kind of unpredictable. Sometimes it's great uh, meaning that you do something and people are happy and you know you're getting new customers and the team is uh, very excited to work on that and everything is perfect but a lot of times you do something you spend a lot of hours and work on that and it's and flops you know nobody's really interested in and you don't really understand why and you're that's kind of that kind of sucks but uh, it's part of the game basically part of the education process your own education process and um hopefully you'll learn more from your mistakes than from your successes actually. So uh, we're trying to do as much mistakes as possible. What are your main challenges as a leader, as an mm-hmm. owner, you see, when, when you have 60 people that you have to lead somewhere? Yeah. I mean, you should have some personal challenges. Yeah. My personal challenge is delegation. delegation. I'm struggling with that. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> It's, uh, I've been doing a lot better than I have been uh, before, but uh, I feel that there's a lot of room for improvement because it's, it's kind of hard um, to let go. And I guess that everyone faces that at one point or the other in their careers when they're like, there's more people in the team and you have to redistribute the, the stuff that you do. Um, for me personally, it was always very hard to kind of give away some stuff, but um, the more I do do that, um, the more I realized that oh, that's probably that one of the things that should have, I should have started doing earlier mm-hmm. rather than later because people are doing today the things that have been doing previously so much better than me. Mm-hmm. And um, ask me about it five years ago and I would say, no, I'm the best. And I would mean it. Uh, well, I'm, I'm probably good at something, but I'm definitely not the best in all of things. So and people are, are doing amazing work in project management, sales, web development, architecture, and pretty much everything that I did even people management. I mean, we have a we have great teams pretty much covering all of the stuff that we do. And the people who are in there right now are doing much better work than me in almost everything. So I'm I'm really happy to to have all these folks uh, with us. And um, that's uh, that's something that is still my, my do you, challenge. Do you make sure to tell them how great they are? Is that part of your company culture? That's part of my job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, do you have your daily routine that keeps, you know, going, keeps you in balance? You know, it's fancy now to wake up at 5 a.m., yeah. do yoga, meditate, <laughs> <laughs> but it, not, it doesn't work for everyone. Yeah, it actually works pretty well for me. Uh, okay. <laughs> Five o'clock. Yeah. Oh my uh, God. Well, yeah, actually a few years ago, <clears throat> both me and my co-founder have stumbled upon a book. It's called um, Miracle Morning, I believe. It was actually pretty good, uh, very inspiring and... Um, I started reading it and then my, my co-founder literally like uh, maybe a month later, he sends me a few quotes from that book saying, hey, look at that. I found this book. I'm like, whoa, 
That's pretty cool. I have never been a morning person, never. And I was like, okay, I want to sleep in and stuff. But um, they give a lot of good arguments in terms of why uh, it will make a lot of sense for you to kind of start a little earlier. It doesn't necessarily have to be 5 a.m. Just uh, earlier than you normally do is, is fine. Um, yeah, so that's what I do. And that's kind of, a, I found time for for sports, which is now a big part of my life. Um, and it kind of helps me to balance a lot of things out. So do you do that at 5 a.m.? Uh, I do that at 7 a.m. every day. And what do you do from 5 to 7? <laughs> oh, I, yeah. So <laughs> I, I do the, the the regular routine. Basically, I wake up, I, I meditate, I think about plan, plan a day, mm. and uh, you know, just just relax before the whole thing you know, kind of kicks in and starts. Did you um, n- notice any changes since you started doing that? Because, you know, the book can say a lot of whys you should do that, but that, that mm-hmm. doesn't always match your why, personal whys. Yeah, definitely. Because basically the, the essence of it is that if you start your day earlier, you have the time where you're undisturbed when you can do things that are, are important to you that will make you feel like your day wasn't lost. Because we all had these days when you kind of wake up You kind of go around do a lot and of things. do a lot of things. And in the end of the day, you feel like, okay, what happened? I'm not even sure. It's like you did nothing. Uh, and it still happens sometimes. But um, if you kind of carve out the time in the morning early on for what's important to you, for what you really want to work on, it's almost guaranteed that you will make some progress every day towards your goals. And this has kind of been a game changer for me. But it helped a lot with uh, creating some more um, structure. Uh, better planning and uh, mm-hmm. clear vision in terms of what's actually going to happen on that day. And if it does, even if it doesn't work perfectly like I planned, I still managed to do at least something for, from what's important on that day. And it makes you feel so much more fulfilled and, and better about pretty much everything, like a better human being. Maybe it's like a little exaggeration, but uh, it actually works. So it does work. So What apps are you using for your like normal personal life or like maybe you can suggest something oh. life management apps. life management <laughs> yes. i guess my uh, my number one app to to go with is todoist uh, is um one of them to do apps i mean there's a lot of them but i found that this one is the best for me it uh, no fluff mm-hmm. uh, very straightforward uh, easy uh, and a non-tiring design and it has pretty much all this stuff recurring um things uh, reminders priorities and different projects. I Pretty much all my thoughts and all my plans are in Todoist because um, I found out that uh, the much better use of somebody's mind is about creating ideas, not storing them. So I try to write things down whenever I think of them uh, mm-hmm. before I forget to make sure that they're somewhere. That's and usually, a good one. Yeah, there is in Todoist. Uh, that's, uh, that's one. I use a lot of sports app to track my, uh, my fitness activity. It's very inspiring and it's kind of motivating for me. Uh, like a, a regular... Apple mm-hmm. activity thing is, is big, big for me. So uh, I've, when, whenever, the, a few years ago when Apple Watch just, just appeared, um, I bought the first one and uh, it was kind of fancy and, uh, you know, but there was really no, not a lot of sense for me back in the day to kind of use it. And, uh, but now, I think a couple of years ago when I started doing more sports, actually it was during the pandemic, I was running a lot. I rediscovered the Apple Watch for me and it's so inspiring. I mean, it's one of the best things. Like for me, it really works when you're tracking your calories and tracking your activity and kind of do better, do the challenges, compete with your friends. This really, really works. And uh, basically it's um, a huge part of my life right now. So I'm I'm doing a lot of sports, I'm doing a lot of things and I'm feeling really great by myself. So uh, fitness tracking is, is one of the other things that I definitely recommend. And then a lot of more other niche apps, like I'm, uh, I have this great application that's called Back Then, totally unrelated to business. It's um, an application that is basically a, a photo book that tracks the photos and videos of your kids. Hmm. And you can basically scroll through different ages of your kids and go, okay, this is how it looked. He looked like three months. This is how he looked at six months. This is how hmm. he or she looked at like one year. And it's like basically a photo album that's always with you. And uh, it's amazing. Tell us about you and Moldova. Mm. Certainly, Moldova is the best country in the world. Yes. But the anyway, <laughs> somehow you got here. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us how come that you are here now. Yeah, it's a, it was an interesting story. So um, I was working, well, I'm originally from Uzbekistan. Um, I was born in Samarkand. Uh, well, that's uh, one of the three most ancient cities in, in Uzbekistan, maybe in the world too. Um, and then I lived for a long time in Tashkent and I worked in a, in a big 
company, uh, a mobile operator, a local one, which is, was part of the family of Teria Sonera, and uh, which was a kind of a sister company to the local mold cell. It was called U-Cell, uh, mm-hmm. U-Cell mold cell, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, and um, I got a job in an international company that was um, providing mold cell in Moldova, a uh, solution for their for their business. And since I had a lot of experience with that solution already back in Uzbekistan, I was offered a job here in Chisinau. Apparently they were able to find, to find a person to be able to lead the team here. So I got lucky, uh, I guess. Um, and uh, so that's where they asked me do I, if, if I knew Romanian. I said, nope. <laughs> and I did back then. Uh, so, and, uh, but this, okay, you're, you're no Russian right now. Like, yeah, okay. That's, uh, then we're waiting for you. So I came to Chisinau and, um, 2013 it was january and it was it was a little sad because <laughs> you know back in tashkent i mean the winters are also pretty cold and it can get snowy and all but we have at least a couple of days a, a week when there's sun and the first first time i came it was like no sun for for a few days okay no sun for for a week okay no sun for a month i'm like what is happening? I was like, this is not something that I'm used to. And it was like, okay. Then, um, then I left in March and I came back in April and it was a totally different place, completely different. I was, I, I was instantaneously in love. It was like oh, all the blossoming, all the green and all the flowers. I'm like, oh, is this really the same place? Did, did, did I, you know, mix planes or stuff? And, um, yeah, so it was very... There are no women and wine in your story. And I wonder I'm why. Getting to it. I'm getting to it. <laughs> well, uh, sorry. Take a sip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the wine, uh, yeah, I, I barely knew anything about wine when I came to Moldova. I, I, I could probably literally, if you blindfold me, I wouldn't probably be able to tell white from red uh, if, if you would, you know, give it yeah. to me. Uh, now I'm a connoisseur. <laughs> More of, well, at least. I still don't drink a lot, but still, uh, I mean, people in Uzbekistan didn't know back then a lot about wine. Maybe they do now, but I'm kind of more of a Moldovan in that regard by now. Uh, so yeah, um, women and wine were a great, a great argument that kind of kept me going a lot in Moldova. Um, and uh, yeah, eventually the project was over. Uh, so we, we did install that system and it worked great um, in, in, for Moldsel. And then the next projects for the same company were in the vicinity. There was a project in Ukraine, there was a project in Poland, there was a project in Bulgaria, in France, and they were pretty much here in Europe um, most, of the, most of the time. And uh, the, the, there was a, an alternative for me to either go back to Tashkent and then fly for a very long time back to these countries or kind of work remotely or stay here in Moldova with the women in wine. When I, when I first came and I stayed here, people were like, why, why, why did you come here? What's your problem? I'm like, I mean, it's great here. Like, are you crazy? We have this problem and this problem. Yeah, and like, but you have this one and this one and this one that you know a lot of people don't have. For example, in Uzbekistan back in the day, it was a, an issue with the banks. For example, there was a it was very problematic to convert your local currency to US, US dollars. Mm-hmm. It was almost impossible. There were no ATMs. Um, I mean, it was, it was very problematic. And here, it was completely different. The travel so much easier. What you're saying basically is that we should learn how to value. For sure, what we have. We have. Uh, it's 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 difficult and because see the you know see the beautiful uh, side yeah, of it. It's kind of it's, it's kind of difficult for you to to value something that you have until you either lose it or you see the worst of it. So I had almost an advantage because I was coming here and there were a lot of things uh, in here that people who live here locally didn't appreciate all that much because they're kind of used to them and they saw like something better in Europe that was better mm-hmm. than something that was at home. But I was coming from a from a lower start, if you will. And I was like, okay, this is great. And this is great. And this is great. And, the, and uh, I, was, I was really fascinated by the country before the wine women. But wine women are obviously great. And that's why I got married and I have two kids. So. <laughs> okay. Um, Vlad, I really, really, really enjoyed this discussion with you. And I think we can keep going on and on and on. <laughs> uh, but I guess we'll just have to wrap up here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for over. having me. It was great. Thank you. Very inspiring. This podcast is supported by the Economic Policy Advice to the Moldovan Government Project, implemented by GIZ Moldova with the financial support of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development and of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation.